This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas 75771, or calling 903 963 8626. You are welcome to make additional cassettes of this message for free distribution to friends. However, for all other forms of reproduction or electronic transmission, existing copyright laws apply. My message this morning, God is doing a new thing in His church. God is doing a new thing in His church. Please go to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Start verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Either go down to the sea, and all that is then therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Skip to verse 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I've been still. This is God speaking. I refrain myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. A travailing woman is one who's about to bring forth birth. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you that you have all things under control. And Lord, you rule from the heavens and you rule on the earth. You rule in our hearts. God, I ask you to help me to convey the word that you've pressed into my heart. Lord, I see something coming that's amazing and glorious. You are going to do, and you are in the process of doing a new thing in your church. God, help us to see it. Open our hearts and our eyes and our ears. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand. Holy Spirit, give us understanding. Anoint the word that goes forth now and sanctify this vessel, there would be nothing, O Lord, that would hinder the flowing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How often have you heard this, God is doing a new thing? People traverse all over the world trying to get into that new thing, visit it and taste it and see what it's about, and it soon dies. And it proves to be not a new thing. The average life of the new thing, they called it revivals, they called it movings, they call it uh, uh, visitations, they call it the new thing. The average life of the new thing, revivals, about five years. Five years and it's gone and you can't find it again. And let me say that the new thing that God is going to do, you don't have to travel. It's going, it is worldwide. It is happening even now all over the globe. You're not going to have to go anywhere other than the house of God. <clears throat> Let me tell you that before God brings in the new, he has to do away with the old. This is a biblical principle. You'll find it all through the Bible. God will raise up a work. He'll do a new thing. And in just a few generations, hypocrisy sets in, idolatry sets in. Wickedness sets in, and God has to bypass it. This principle was first introduced to, uh, uh, in Shiloh. The scripture is very clear on what God did there. During the time of the judges, Shiloh, there was an established work of God at Shiloh. This is where God spoke. This is where Samuel heard the voice of God. And at one time, Shiloh means that which is the Lord's, that which is the Lord, that which represents who God is, that which reveals his character and his nature. It's where God speaks. It's where God hears the prayers of his people, it's where the altar is. And the, Eli was the high priest. And his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, ministers of the sanctuary. But the time came when God said, I I can't put up with this anymore. It no longer represents who I am because of the defilement, because of the apathy. 
because of the, fre- the flesh that crept into Shiloh, God says, I'm finished with it. And it was beyond redemption. Eli was blind to his condition. Adultery, fornication in the house of God. And God looked at Shiloh and said, that does not represent me anymore. And God says, I'm moving on. I'm turning this over to flesh. Ichabod was written above the door. He said, don't pray for it. Don't, don't bleed. There, there's no resuscitation. There's no revival that will resurrect it. I'm finished with Shiloh. And God walked away and turned it over to Ichabod. The glory of the Lord departed, the scripture says. God says, I'm moving on. <clears throat> this does not represent who I am. It doesn't represent my character and the nature of Almighty God. There was no one standing in the gap for Shiloh. There was no one crying in repentance, oh God, don't depart from us. No one was asking, where is the Lord gone? And and God says, "I'm, I'm finished with it. I'll do a new thing. God raised up a new thing, a new house. There's a temple in Jerusalem. And it was called the Lord's house. Once again, the Lord did a new thing and the the Lord's presence was there. The glory of the Lord came down at one time and filled the house with such power they couldn't even stand to minister. It represented who God was. It, It was a manifestation of his nature. And the altar was there. It was a house of prayer. But all once it just takes a few generations for a church for a, a new thing of God to degenerate, to, to fall into hypocrisy and apathy. And, and because the, the ministry becomes flesh driven and because the ministry loses that red hot passion that brought it to birth, then it passes on to just become an institution. It's just a memory of what God once did. And this happened in the temple During the time of Jeremiah, how soon decay set into that new thing that God had set up and how soon it no longer represented who God was. This has been the history of God's people. God leaves the old and he raises up something new. And and, and so quickly, you, you read the history of the Old Testament, it's amazing how quickly the, the, the decay and the backsliding, people bent on backsliding, and God has to leave the old and raise up a fresh work. The new work he raises up so quickly, the leaders become competitive. They organize until the Holy Spirit doesn't have any room to work. Something amazing happens, just as it did with Eli. They become politicians. The competition for power and prestige and for numbers. And once again, God said, this does not represent me. I'm finished with it. He sends Jeremiah to stand at the gate at the Lord's house, it says, and proclaim a devastating word. And these are the words that he delivered. Amend your ways. And I will cause you to dwell in this place. In other words, he says, I don't want to walk away from this. Amend your ways. Repent. Come back to your first love. Come back to the fire of God. And today would be come back to the centrality of Christ. You've gotten so far off into competition. You've gotten so far off on all these other things. Amend your ways. The scripture says, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. In other words, God says, I'll stay with you. My presence will be with you. I'll still move in your midst. I won't leave you. I, I, I will save this. What he's saying, God will leave this temple. The, uh, the people were saying, saying to him, to Jeremiah, no, no, no. This is the temple they called the temple, the temple, the temple. And, and Jeremiah said, don't tell me anything about the temple. They were saying, you, you can't even conceive of God destroying this. What of our traditions? They pointed to their traditions and their entrenched leadership over the years and all of the majestic buildings. And they said, how can God bring ruin to this? This is what represents God. And, and they were depending on their history and their traditions. 
And Jeremiah comes back and says, here's the word of the Lord. Go back to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first. God said, I walked away from the church. And I'm going to walk away from you because you have become just like Shiloh. And see what I did to it for wicked, the wickedness of my people Israel. What he's saying, come on, you pastors, all you shepherds and all you princes of Israel. Come on, gather around now and get your Bibles out. Come on now and look what I do. Look at the principle. See how I work. See my nature. You've allowed sin. You've allowed corruption in the body. And, and, and this does no longer represent me. And I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I walked away from Shiloh. And I'm going to walk away from this because you've become the old thing. You don't represent me anymore. My presence is going to go. I'm taking my glory. Jeremiah 7:14. Therefore will I do unto this house which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. You see, God said it's all over. He, he said, I see no one standing in the gap. I see no one concerned about the possibility of my glory departing my house. I don't see the fire once saw before. I see compromise. Now I see apathy. And, and folks, it comes a time when God says there's no revival now. There's no resuscitation. There's no new thing I'm going to do with the old. I'm not even going to work on this foundation anymore. I'm going to do a new thing. Scripture says, Jeremiah said, therefore, God said, therefore, pray not for this people. Don't lift up or cry or pray. For them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear these, that it's over. I, I have to have a people that know my character and represent me to the heathen and to the world who I truly am. Now you find Christ coming finally <clears throat> to Jerusalem with an invitation and a warning. This is another work that God tried to establish. His invitation was, come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come unto me, and I'll give you satisfaction. I'll open your blind eyes, and I'll heal your sick. And I'll satisfy you, and I'll be merciful, and I'll forgive your sins, and I will raise up a mighty, a mighty work. But the Bible says, Jesus said, they would not. Is God going to do in the New Testament what he did in the Old, Old Testament? In the day of grace, he that is mercy and grace incarnate, is he going to say in these days, in the New Testament era, is he going to say to a, a people, that's it? I, you have grown old. You have grown to the place where you no longer represent me. This is not what I'm about. Does God walk away again? Matthew 23, 37 to 39, Jesus said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I send you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He weeps over Jerusalem and he says, It's over. This no longer represents me. I've come. There, there is no desire for repentance. There is no one standing in the gap. You refuse the mercy. You refuse the grace. You receive my covenants. You, you, you reject my covenants. You have rejected everything that God has to offer. Now, your house is left to you desolate. And he said, my presence. You will not see my presence again till you stand before my judgment. Until you stand before the throne, you will not see it. The rest of your religious life will be conducted without the glory of God, without the presence of God, without the anointing. Your shepherds will be shepherds of flesh. They will not be spiritual men. 
Christ's disciples couldn't believe it. They took him back to Jerusalem and said, look, master, look at the temple. Look at the majesty of the buildings. Look at the tradition. Look at all of the high priests, the Sanhedrin. Look at the Pharisees. And all of these traditions have been passed down since Moses. And you're saying it's all over. He said, yes, it's all over. I'm going to do a new thing. Jesus moved on to Pentecost. Hallelujah. He moves into Pentecost, raising up a new thing, a new church. You see, the old thing still drags on. God doesn't do away with it. He just turns it over to the flesh. And they, they, they go through it. This, these are, this is the Abiathar ministry. This is the remains of the Eli ministry. They're still in the outer court. They're still going through, and the people don't know any, anything different. They, they don't know the difference. Meanwhile, God has raised up uh, <clears throat> another ministry. He's raised up a new work. This brings us to the church of the 21st century. Since Pentecost to this very day. And I ask you a question. When you consider what's happening in the 21st century modern church. Does this church that you see now, I'm talking about, consider what is called the church. Consider all the denominations, Protestant denominations, consider any church you choose, the charismatic movement. You think of all the flesh, the competition, the measuring of success by materialistic standards. You look at all that is happening in the church, even of Jesus Christ. Does this represent who Jesus is in the last day? Is this the bride that he's coming for, spotless, without spot or wrinkle? Does this represent a church that is revealing the nature of God and who God is to a lost world? Is this the best the Holy Ghost can do? People cackling like chickens and barking like dogs. Is this the best we can do is just to build big buildings and jam them with people so we can go about boasting how large our churches are? Or has this modern church once again become the old thing? Is God walking away once again, the same pattern all through the word of God, when God looks down and said, this no longer represents me. This is not what I want the heathen to see of my nature. This is not what represents my heart anymore. Will it happen one last time before Jesus comes that God raises up a new thing? Absolutely, yes. That's the heart of my message, and it's right here. Behold, the former things have come to pass. New things do I declare before they spring up. I'm going to tell you about them. The church today, of today, this modern church started at Pentecost, and it started in humility with the glory of God on it. It started with repentance, love for one another, a body consisting of all races, there was evangelism, a spirit of sacrifice, and even martyrdom. Jeremiah 2.21, I planted thee a noble vine, a right seed. How then have you turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? And what does God mean, you've turned into a degenerate plant? He said, I planted you right. That was my church. That, that was my house. That was a house of prayer. You turned it into a house of robbers. What has happened? This no longer represents my heart. It's become a degenerate plant, the Bible says. Let me talk about this degeneracy in the modern church, the 21st century church. Let me talk about what God calls the degenerate plant. Idolatry has always been the problem, always has and always will be idolatry in his house. 
Idolatry was the sin that destroyed Shiloh. The sin that brought down the temple. And it's the sin, the modern day sin, that's going to cause God to walk away from the old thing and begin a new thing. But my people have changed their glory into that which doth not profit. That, that speaks of idolatry. Ezekiel 14 chapter, there, there were a group of elders that came to Jeremiah. You see, God was about to walk away from this old thing. And, and so the leaders came to him and really they were saying, we want to know what God is saying. What is God saying? The scripture says certain elders of Israel came to Jeremiah to inquire of the Lord. In essence, they're saying, what is God saying? We're open. We want to hear what God is saying in these days. And God spoke to Jeremiah, gave him a revelation and said, these men have set up idols in their heart. They put a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of them at all? Do they think that I'm going to answer them? That I'm going to give them an answer. They come as though they were seekers. And he, he said, no, they have an idol and they have put a stumbling block in front of their, their face. You see, I've heard over the years that idolatry is anything that, that stands between me and God. Anything that takes me away from the Lord. That's a very poor description of idolatry. Because the, these men had set up idols and they came to God. It didn't, nothing stood in their way. They, they came, appearing to be hungry for God and a word from heaven. And the Bible said they'd set up idols in their heart. But he mentions two things. There's an idol and there's a stumbling block of iniquity. You see, the real sin is not just the doctrine. The idol is the doctrine of success and prosperity. It always has been. All... All worship of Baal, Moloch, Ashtoreth, all of the, the idols all represented prosperity and success. That is the gospel today that has polluted and defiled the church of Jesus Christ around the world. It's a perversion of a blessing that God intended for the church. God has always intended to bless his church, but this is a perversion. By those who have not been prostrated before God. I want you to listen. The idol has to have a stumbling block with it. The stumbling block is the doctrine that justifies the idol. All modern idolatry has developed, invented a doctrine to justify it. And those, listen... I know many who preach this. They are morally clean men and women. They don't cheat on their mates. They, are, they have integrity. But you cannot shake them from this. It's a stumbling block of iniquity that is stumbling and causing shipwreck to the church of Jesus Christ to millions. From the heart of Africa to the heart of Russia and now every place on the planet. It's a, an idolatry. And it's got a stumbling block of iniquity and idolatry always invents a theology to justify it. And that's where the sin lies. Success is postmodernism. Postmodernism says this, and this is very closely. <clears throat> Is that the community gives you purpose, the community gives you value in life, the community bestows upon you influence and purpose in life by how successful you are and how much influence you have. That's postmodernism. That means that if, if you're very successful and you have a good job and you're making good money and you have influence in your career, they bestow on you, all your peers bestow upon you. That's where your purpose is. They give you that purpose. They bestow it upon you. Acceptance and who I am. That postmodernism has crept into the church. And now, the peers, the religious peers, bestow upon you 
If you're successful and you have built great facilities and you can boast of the millions of dollars and, and you have the influence and, and you hobnob with the president and you have all of these things that are, 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 are ancillary to all of the so-called blessings that you have attained in life by your own talent and your own power and your own zeal. It's postmodernism and it's right out of the pits of hell. Folks, I'm going to tell you where I get my purpose, where I get my self-value, and that's my walk with Jesus Christ. He alone bestows value and purpose into our lives. No one else, nowhere else. I've got to hurry on. What is this new thing that God is now doing in his church? In one sentence, I give it to you. God is raising up a ministry and a people who will lay hold of the true blessing of God. The one that was promised and was perverted. The blessing that the modern church has misrepresented and defiled. I'll try to explain that as we, we go here. The true blessing was first revealed to Moses. And he revealed it and gave it to Aaron, the high priest. And Aaron represents Christ, our high priest, in this, in this particular blessing. I want you to go and show you this blessing in Numbers, the sixth chapter, sixth chapter of Numbers. Starting at verse 22. And we're trying to make this as simple as possible. Folks, I told you that God's plan always from the very beginning is that God would bless his people. But you see, they ran off with this blessing and perverted it and turned it into something materialistic. They turned it into something that was of flesh and not spirit. And here, starting in verse 22, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise shall you bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. They shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. All right, let's look at this and go through it. I want to make a simple pause. On this wise or in this way, ye shall bless the children of God or children of Israel. There was one formula. There's one definition of blessing. And God said, this is the only way right now. There is a true blessing. There's only one kind of blessing. And God, the new thing God is going to do, he's going to raise up pastors and congregations with a revelation of what this blessing is. It's promised to the church of Jesus Christ. It's promised to those who overcome. This is an absolute true blessing. And he, he says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. This is the revelation of the keeping power of Jesus Christ in the horrible, terrible times ahead. That which is coming. There is going to be a church who understands the keeping power of Jesus Christ. The keeping power. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Here's a people in the last days, in the new thing that God's going to do. By revelation. First of all, he's going to do away with the old and how he's doing that right now. He's going into churches, one here, two here, five here, and sometimes a whole congregation who have been well fed and in the word of God. And they said, we're coming out of this old thing. It doesn't necessarily mean leaving denomination, but he creates a hunger. He creates an absolute uh, disgust with the old thing. Absolute disgust where you dare not go to a church where you're not fed. You dare not go to a church or a place where there's no life. And this, this, this people, I see it all over the country. Something stirring, especially in young pastors. They are tired of the hype. They're tired of the bigness. They're tired of the foolishness. And they're just hungry for God. And they say, we want to know who God is. And they're coming back to the centrality of Jesus Christ, period. But they know who they are in Christ, and they know his keeping power. 
They don't fear falling because they're already prostrate. It's physically, spiritually impossible to fall if you're already on your face. They're prostrated. And that's where it went wrong from the beginning. The Pharisees took it in into legalism. The modernists, postmodernists have taken it in now to materialism. That God wants you rich. And it's left people empty and dry. But God's going to make them so empty, so dry, they hopefully will be driven back to the cross. God said he's going to judge those after he deals with them and they don't respond. He's going to deal with them severely and he's going to deal with all the people who follow them and believe what they're preaching. Well, the old thing focused on the promises of health, wealth and success. This new thing is a work the Holy Ghost is doing, focusing on covenant promises. The promises like, I the, Lord will, I, I, the Lord, will put my fear in you. I'll take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll cause you to loathe your sin. I'll heal your backslidings. I'll keep you from falling. You see, this new thing that God is going to do, this is what the people are going to come for. I, I want to know what God has promised me. What is this blessing? This blessing says, God says, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you from falling. I'm going to give you a new heart. If you will prostrate yourself before me, if you will seek my face. Folks, there's no safety outside of the embrace of Christ. None. I, the Lord, will do it. There's a blessing of the knowing that God is keeping us. By his power alone, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. And secondly, he says, the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. For this is the church of the clear conscience, not the seared conscience. God cannot show you the power of his grace and mercy until you believe you're secure in him. That... You have his smile. May the, he make his face to shine upon you. This is the favor of God. Folks, how, how can you rejoice in the Lord unless you know his favor? All liberty comes from knowing that I'm in the favor of God. That he's taken the initiative. I've prostrated myself before him. I've asked him to create a hunger and a thirst. I've asked him to give me a new heart. I've laid hold of all of these covenant promises and say, Lord, it's, it's there, but you said I'll still be inquired of you about them. I, I, I will pray for them. I will seek you for these promises that you've made me. I'm not just taking it by faith. I'm taking it now by prostration. And that's not a work. It's just, Lord, I'm here now that you will reveal by your spirit all the fullness of the blessing you promised me in the last day. I'm not looking to you now for a new house, a new car. If, if you want to do that, thank you. I'm open to that. And I know you want to bless me, but that's not my focus. My focus is I want to understand your nature. You do this because you love me. The Lord make his face to shine on you. That's God's initiative. He said, I will make my, my face known to you. I will show you the smile of my face. You come to that prostrate one and tap you on the shoulder. And say, look up and you'll see his smile. Number three. The Lord lift up his countenance unto thee and give thee peace. This speaks of the touch of God, the increase of his touch, the increase of his presence in a life. And here, here I, I, I like the original Hebrew, Jehovah exhibit his satisfaction with thee, therefore giving you peace. The Lord show you how satisfied he is with you. And that is where you get your peace. I know that God is satisfied. 
He satisfied because of the blood of his own son. That satisfied, that satisfied the Father. There's one man that stands before Christ now. One man in whom he is satisfied. He's not satisfied in me. He's satisfied with me in Christ. I'm in Christ and I am. He is as satisfied with me in Christ as he is with his own son. He is satisfied with me. I don't have to have guilt and fear and condemnation. If I sin, if I'm surprised by sin, I go to the blood. I go to the cross. I go to his covenant promises. Glory be to God. And he touches me. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. It's best explained in two verses in Daniel. Daniel 8, 18. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. And he touched me and set me upright and said, Behold, I will make thee know that shall be in the last end. You see, that touch of God is an all-knowing. He said, I, I'm going to have a people in the last days who don't have to have prophets telling them what's happened. Everyone will know the times. I'm going to reveal it to those who are prostrate before me. And I get letters from all over the United States and around the world, ordinary Christians who are praying. And they, they, they are hearing things I've never heard. They are hearing about the end time events and what is happening they're not off the wall. They're not phonies. They are praying people who have heard from God, and it's all the same message. Get ready. God is about to shake everything that can be shaken. They know it. They hear the call. They, they see and they hear. There's an all-knowing. He said, I was on my face, and God touched me and caused me to know what's going to happen in the end. Daniel 10.10, 10, Behold, a hand touched me, which set me on my knees, and upon the palms of my hand. He said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. I'm come to make you understand what shall befall the people in the latter days. But the first thing he said to him, Daniel is prostrate. Daniel says, when he touched me, he put me on my knees in the palm of my hands. And then he came and said, Daniel, oh, Daniel, can you hear the, the cry of God's heart? Oh, Daniel, I love you. Oh, David, I love you. Carter, I love you. Teresa, Barry, Daniel, I love you. You're greatly loved. Oh, I hear that all, all the time. I prostrate for God. God say, David, I love you. I love you. Understand it. That's where your strength comes from. I'm satisfied. I love you. Oh, there's going to be a church walking in the love of God, purged and cleansed because they're prostrate before him and they believe in his promises. I will keep you from falling. I'll be merciful to your sins if you'll simply prostrate yourself before me and be inquired of me. Oh, there's coming a pure ministry, a prophetic ministry born in prayer. Pastors are secure in God's love. It says, finally, they shall put my name upon the children of Israel. In original Hebrew, they shall name my name upon the children of Israel that I may bless them. This is all about a new focus. This, you know, I, I really believe the time is not coming, but is already here. When people are beginning to come to pastors who are preaching truth, who have the revelation of the true blessing promise. I'll tell you, this last day church is going to be a blessed church. Mighty blessed. It's just going to be a remnant. A remnant. God's going to pick them out of here. Hungry hearts from various churches and denominations everywhere. And, and, and the old thing is still going to go on. But God's going to have a people. He is going to have a people that, that are, are centered and focused on Jesus Christ. And they're going to hear the word. They're going to hear word. Folks, I'm, I'm receiving tapes. Now, I'll tell you why, how Pastor Carter got here. The Lord sent him here, but he did it through a prophet who sent me two tapes. And I heard a word from heaven. I heard a word from the throne. And I asked him to come here and preach. And, and we soon realized that God had chosen this man. And I'm getting tapes now from everywhere. 
I'm hearing preaching that I just want to fall on my face. It's all about Christ. It's revelation of who he is, his glory, his majesty, his nature. It's just, it's just, it, and I hear it from young ministers all over the world and some elderly folks. I, I'm hearing from older preachers, too, have been hidden in prayer. And now God's bringing them out and they're being heard. And what a revelation of Jesus Christ I'm hearing. And, and now it used to be people would come to, to have hands laid upon them. It says they will he, they will speak my name over the people. They will proclaim my name. There'll be a revelation of his name. They will proclaim my name over the people so that there's an understanding. And the people respond by coming and saying, look, uh, would you lay hands on me? I heard you preach, Brother David. I heard you preach, Brother Carter. I heard you preach, Brother Neil. Brother Patrick, I heard you preach. And I'm getting some of it, but I don't have the full revelation. Would you lay your hands on me and pray that God will open my eyes and give me eyes to see and ears to hear? They're not coming just for healing. They're coming for revelation. They're coming for their eyes to be open. I'd like to see prayer lines like that, where the pastors can pray for people and say, people that are hungry, say, I want more. I want my eyes open. I want to understand. We have got to understand who God is in these last days. We're not cheerleaders. We are here to reveal the heart of God and his nature. They shall name my name upon or over the people. Folks, I'm going to close in just a moment. The old thing is going to end up in the world church. When I was in Europe, just came back a few weeks ago. Newspapers were screaming. The United States of Europe. The Constitution has already been drawn up. They've not all signed yet, but that's coming very shortly. England's going to join it. And then it's it's a it's the United States your newspaper right in the front page. There was a cry for a strong president. One man said, we hope he has dictatorial powers. A president of the United States of Europe. And listen closely now. In Germany, there's a move on right now to start the machinery for one world church. All of Europe, the United States of Europe, with one church. One church. And folks, that's where it's all going to end up. It's going to end up in this one world church. But God's already saying, go ahead, that's flesh. It has nothing to do with it. But he's raising up something new and fresh. Folks, I, I've never been so excited in all my life. I Everywhere I've gone, Pastor Carter's seen it. And anyone who travels anywhere in the world, you see it. Young people. Young people hungry for God. So tired of religion. So tired of the deadness. When, when I was in London, they, they closed 1,500 Anglican churches this past year. 1,500. They call it desanctifying. They desanctified 1,200 churches. Shut them down. And everywhere we went, we saw cathedrals turned into museums on the occult. We saw one that had, you walk through, and all ghosts and goblins and things like this. God has lifted his spirit from the old thing. And he's going to do one last new thing before he comes. He's going to have a church spotless. Not through works. Not through legalism. He's going to have a covenant church. He's going to have pastors after his own heart who are going to minister. And all the hungry, all the seeking are going to flock to that house to hear the word of the Lord. They're going to preach that kind of gospel. Glory be to God. God's not, God's not finished, folks. He's just begun. I want to be a part of that, don't you? I want to be a part of that. Will you stand? <laughs> Beloved, would you hear a last word? How do we stay apart? 
How do we become a part of this new thing that I'm talking about that God is doing? You, you, you see, if we don't prostrate ourselves before God, if, if we don't continue to seek Him, in fact, if we don't increase in hunger, if, if, if we allow apathy or lukewarmness to creep into our house and into our hearts, God will find the people. He can move down the street. He can start something else. But God doesn't want to do that because he's found a hungry people. And we stay prostrated before God and we seek his face as never before. And that means in your homes, not just in the house of God, but in your home. God's been impressing me. David, you want to be a part of what I'm doing? Just stay prostrate before me. Stay on your face. Stay before me. When I stay prostrate, that doesn't mean just physically laying out, but it's just spending time with God, seeking his face, fasting and praying and saying, Lord, quicken my spirit. And Lord, show me your nature. Show me who you are. I want to know you. It's this, this intimacy of knowing, this all-knowing of who he is. You can't get that parked in front of a television wasting hours. If you're going to do that, you're just going to come to this house empty and dry. You have nothing to add. But all if you've been on your face, if you spent some time before you come into God's house. And the pastors here have provided some time for you before the services to come in and just pray. But oh, I think this has to do with the, where you live, where you lay your head down. Could we, we sing a chorus? God's not going to bypass this church. This is a part of what he's doing. This is the new thing he's doing, not just here, but in other churches in this city. And I believe those pastors are coming to pray with Pastor Carter and the team. They're going to see that. I talked to a, to a young pastor last night. and Someone sent me his tape. And I heard something I've just thrilled my soul. So I called on the phone. The number was on the tape. And he was so surprised. And I was telling him, I said, I'm going to be preaching about a new thing God's doing. He said, that's what I'm preaching. That's what I'm preaching. I see a new thing coming. God's, God's going to leave the old and he's going to start it. And one last new thing before he comes. He was so excited. That an old man could hear what a young man heard. Jesus, thank you for the hope. Glory be to God. Lord, this is a praying church. We're praying for the whole world. We're praying for every nation, including ours. And now, Lord, we're praying for a complete, full revelation of our covenant walk and covenant promises with you. And, Lord, the hope that you put before us and the true blessing of God, the favor and the smile of God upon those who seek him with all their heart and soul and mind, who are not focused on just making money, not focused on their own agenda, not focused on material things, but have a heart for Christ, just hungering and thirsting for more of you, Jesus. That's as simple as that. I saw many hands visiting here for the first time, and I speak to you and also to those who make this your church home. <clears throat> Some of you now that are visiting first, and in the annex as well, you're standing here now, and there's, there's something been happening to you. It's, it's a drift, just slowly, slowly drifting from the fire. There, there's not that absolute fire of Christ. It's not the fire of the Holy Spirit burning. You don't feel that pathos of Christ. You don't feel that zeal. You don't feel that, that power of his love in your heart. Now, I don't, I'm not putting your church down. I don't know what church you go to. That's not what my message was about. But if, you, if you're here now and you say, well, Brother Dukes, my church is kind of dead. Perhaps that feeds that drift in you. Maybe you haven't heard a convicting word that's just like a knife into your heart. And maybe while you were here this morning, you, you have something in your heart crying out, I want 
more than I have. I want to be a part of what God's doing in this last days. And I'll, I want God to bring me into a fellowship where I can, I can have God work in me and do a new thing in me. And wherever you're at, in the balcony, you can go to the stairs on either side. And here in the auditorium, you can come. And in the annex, if you don't know Christ... Or if you have drifted, I'm talking about a drift. You are in a drift right now. And you, there, there may be a love in your heart. And some of you have been totally backslidden to the Lord. You've allowed sin in your heart like you've never allowed before. And things are happening. You're, you're going more and more toward the world and the things of the world. I want you, if the Spirit's speaking to you, if you feel that tug and pull of the Spirit while they sing this chorus, I want you to come. In the annex, if you go to the lobby... They'll give you direction to come. You can walk down the aisle here, and I'll meet you here, and we'll pray with you. And upstairs and here in the main auditorium. Please don't come. I don't want to just flood this altar. I'm talking specifically to those who, who have not received Christ yet, and you feel the tug and pull of the Holy Spirit. And those who say, Pastor Dave, that's me. You hit it right on the mark. I came here this morning not knowing what to expect, and the Lord has confronted me by His Spirit. I want you to move when the Spirit moves on you and come down here and we'll pray as God to do a new thing in you. That's it. Follow these that are coming. Just come right up here to the front now. No one will beg you. No one will plead. No, you don't sign anything. You come because of your job. Move in close, please. Right up here to the front. The Lord bless you. God's not mad at you. The Holy Spirit's calling you and wooing you. You wouldn't have come except... It were a work of the Holy Spirit. If it were just of the flesh, you would have chickened out somewhere before you ever walked down here. You're here because the Lord's called you. The Lord's doing something new in your heart. Wouldn't it be wonderful to walk away from this altar knowing that the Lord is totally satisfied with you? And you know it. You don't have to wonder about it anymore. You don't have to live in guilt and fear and condemnation. I'm going to ask you, ask you to, to confess. Confess your self-centeredness, doing things your own way, and say, Lord, I'm going to yield to your way now and to your heart. You pray this for me. Jesus, I surrender to you my will, my body, soul, and spirit. Cleanse me from all iniquity. Forgive me, Lord, for running, for doing things my way. I come now to the cleansing of the blood of Christ and to Jesus, who is my high priest. Oh, Jesus, oh, Christ of heaven, I thank you for the promises you made to keep me, to save me, keep me from falling. And I know now I can't satisfy you by anything I do. I'm sad. You will be satisfied because I gave my life to Christ and my sins are under his blood. And he satisfied you. And I am no, I know now that you're satisfied with me because I'm in Christ. Let me pray for you now. Heavenly Father, it does not take all night. It doesn't take some great theology just takes an open heart that says, I need you, Jesus. I need you. I need you. Folks, if you're saying that, if, if your heart's reaching out, I need you, Jesus. Would, would you just look up to him, close your eyes and just look up to him and just breathe it out in your heart. Just say it in your own words, Lord. I need you. I'm hungry for you. I want to know who you are. I want your truth. Don't let me just put the words in your heart. Let it come from inside, deep inside. Lord, I need you. Father, we all need you right now. Lord, you want to be able to speak into the heart of all of these. I love you. Let them hear that cry of God. Oh, how I love you. I'm satisfied because you have come into Christ by faith and confession and repentance of your sins. Lord, is that, it's not complicated. Thank you, Jesus. Could you thank him in your own words now? Could you just give him thanks? Say, thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I give you thanks. I give you thanks. This is the conclusion of the message.